This program is brought to you by Abiding Above Ministries. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn to James chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 2 through 12, and then I'm going to look at some other verses. You say, well, what are you going to talk about? Well, I'm going to be talking about our speech. What we say is powerful. It's powerful in a bad way, or it can be very powerful in a good way. But I'm telling you, every time you open up your mouth, and every time I open up my mouth, it's helping people to see what's inside of me. When I talk, just in normal conversation, people know what I'm thinking about. They know what's important to me. And basically, in a sense, it exposes me. What we say exposes what we are inside of these bodies. And so the title of this message is Graceful Speech. Graceful Speech. How we think and how we feel determines what we say. Think about that. How you're feeling, how you're thinking, and how you're feeling determines what will come out of your mouth next. What we say with our mouth and tongue can be very powerful. In many ways, you will find that what you say to others sets the direction of your life and your future. You may say something to one person, and y'all don't know each other at all. But just in a brief conversation, you might say something. They may give you a job opportunity that would make you a multiplied millionaire for the years to come. Or someone may be interested in you saying, I would like for him to work for my company. But then you say something and think, whoa, now they're nervous to approach you about a particular job. What we say is a very powerful thing. What you say plays a big part in your vocation. What you say plays a big part in your present position in your vocation. In other words, if they're thinking about moving people up in a company and they're saying, who are we going to move up? What you have said prior to them making a decision puts it in their mind. He would be a good person. Let's move him up to the manager spot. Or they say, no way. All because they've heard you say things. What you say plays a big part in getting married. Is that not right? What you say can cause you not to have any friends. Or what you say can cause you to have many friends. I mean, our mouth, the roof of our mouth, our gums, our teeth, and our tongue. If we did not have that, we could not speak. We do have those, so we can speak. Is it making you or is it breaking you? Because you know, what we say we can't blame on anyone else. Because it comes out of our heart and comes out of our mouth. We cannot blame anyone for what we say. We have to look in the mirror. So, what you say can shape the mind and direction of your children. If your dad tells you you'll never amount to anything when you're young, that can get so fixed in your mind that you act it out. Your dad or your mom could say, God's got a wonderful plan for your life. You get that in your mind and you believe it, and the next thing you know, it begins to happen. All because of what they said. What you say can destroy your marriage. Just one word could destroy your marriage forever. That one word may be, you're stupid. That is it. No more romance. No more genuine love. It is over because she can't get over being called stupid. Or vice versa. He can't get over being called stupid. Just that one word. Our mouth is powerful. What we say is powerful. What you say can be a blessing to your church and what you say could bring your church to a ruin. I've watched this happen in churches here in uh, the city of Memphis, and I know about these things in places like Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, D.C., over in Arkansas, because pastors share with other pastors. But some people can get aggravated over silly things, and they begin to whisper. It makes them feel better. But what they're saying many times is false 
or it's convoluted, or it's a pure lie, and it affects eventually the whole congregation, all because they speak from an impure heart. It's going to be amazing one day how many people who thought they would go to heaven because they never missed church and they love to study God's word, but they never truly were born again. And when you listen to them speak and what they speak about, it is a signal that they've never truly been born again. So, what you say on the phone to one person can affect the life of a child listening to you from another room. What you say to one person can affect the life of a child listening to you from another room, and you don't know anything about it. Many years ago, my dad, he was out witnessing for the Lord, but he had been sent out by the church. They had a Tuesday night visitation program. And he knocked on one door and the family let him in. And so he talked to the mom and dad in the living room and shared the gospel with them. And then he led in a simple sinner's prayer to pray to receive Christ. What my dad never knew was there was a young boy in his bedroom who could hear him talking through the wall. And he got under conviction by the Holy Spirit. And when my dad led in that sinner's prayer, that young boy prayed to receive Christ. A few months ago, my brother and I drove down to Clarksdale, Mississippi. I was born and raised in the Delta, Clarksdale, Mississippi. And uh, I preached at our home church, the one we grew up in, Oakhurst Baptist. And I had a couple come up to me afterwards and said, you may not know this. And the man said, his name's Sid, his first name's Sid. He said, your dad led me to Christ, but he didn't know it. And then he told my brother and I, I heard him witnessing to my parents in another room. And I believed and received Christ. My friend, listen, what we say is powerful. Very, very powerful. What you say is making you or breaking you when you don't even realize it. What you say is making or breaking other people, young boys and young girls, listening to you, getting what you say fixed into their mind. It's making or breaking others. What you say is extremely important. Matter of fact, the Bible says a deacon in a local church, he's not supposed to be a man of many words. He's supposed to be grave. That means serious, not angry, but serious. And he's to be a man of not many words, but few words, because he does speak, but he's careful what he says. That's the way it should be. So with that in mind, again, I invite you to take God's word and turn to James 3, 2 through 12. I'm going to read this long passage, and then we'll move forward with some other verses. Verse 2 of James 3, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, notice, in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. You think about a stainless steel bit that goes in a horse's mouth. And then the halter is connected to it and goes over his ears to keep it right there. And then there's a rein on either side connected to the bit, comes back up behind the horse's neck, and whoever's riding the horse controls the horse. You and I, as children of God, are supposed to let the loving Holy Spirit who lives inside of us control our mouth. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and read a little further here. Verse 4, James 3, verse 4. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder on the back. That big ship has a small rudder on the back. In whichever way it turns, it turns the whole ship. So also the tongue, your tongue in your mouth, not in someone else's mouth, it is yours is a small part of the body. Think about your physical body. The tongue is a very small part, but probably the most powerful part. 
and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. You light a cigarette, you go for a walk in the middle of winter, and all the grass and everything's dormant, and you throw it down without stepping on it and putting it out, that cigarette can start a forest fire. It can burn up thousands of acres. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. Have you ever listened to the people around you as they talk? The language they use tells you if they're a child of Satan or a child of God. It's so evident. And if you're not a child of God, my friend, I love you, so listen. Don't die today without Christ. And then if you are a child of God, let the Holy Spirit in you bridle you in love so that what you speak lifts up instead of tears down. And so, the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. Think about that. The largest animals that God has ever created on earth have been tamed by the human race. You can go down to Florida and see large sea creatures in captivity for people to buy a ticket to come and watch them. Tamed by human beings. I have fed dolphins in the waters close to Cozumel, Mexico. With my daughter, we fed the dolphins. They came right up to us. They've been tamed. But verse 8 says, no one can tame the tongue. I cannot tame your tongue. I can advise you and encourage you, but no one can tame the tongue. It is something you have to do yourself. It is a restless, evil, and full of deadly poison. Have you ever seen someone that they walk and they look up and they just talk, talk, and talk, and talk? Most of the time, if you listen to them, they're saying perverted words. They're using bad language. Why don't they walk and talk and look around and quote scripture? <laughs> Why don't they do that? Why don't they use basic English that can be uplifting and encouraging why does it always, when someone's walking and talking and just going on and on and on, why is it always bad language? It's because of sin in their mind, will, emotions. God can deliver a person from that, but you must be born again. You're a child of Satan, and you must turn from that and trust what Christ did on the cross. And let him make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen? Either that, or you can march straight into hell, blabbing off perverted words. You know why I call them perverted? Because the man who uses perverted words is a pervert. If you use perverted words, you're a pervert. If you use graceful words, that's evidence that you know God. It's your choice. Where will you spend eternity? What will you be like? So, no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Do you realize when someone makes you angry and you start cursing them using perverted language, do you realize you're cursing someone who was created by God? You say, yeah, but he, he's full of Satan. Well, you know what? Saul of Tarsus was a bad man until he had his Damascus Road experience. Then he became a child of God and wrote most of the New Testament by the Holy Spirit. We cannot give up on anyone until they're physically dead. They may change. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they may believe we cannot give up. They're born 
in the image and likeness of God, though they're without Christ spiritually. So, verse 9, with our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Now, James goes to the inside of a person in this next verse. Watch this. Verse 10, from the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Verse 11, does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? There's an old southern saying, what's in the well comes up in the bucket. Listen, when people listen to you speak with your tongue, it tells them who you are inside. You may try to deceive other people by what you say. But when they listen to you throughout a whole day, they know what's true and what's false. Verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. You know what he's saying? When you open your mouth and speak, everybody knows the truth about you because of what you're saying. It exposes you. Remember Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, self-control. You say, why do you say that? When you're speaking, if there's no love, if there's no joy, if there's no peace, if there's not patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control... If that's not there, then what is there? Language of Satan. Because you're still dead in your trespasses and sins. My friend, listen. You must be born again. And I believe many of you are born again. But I believe there's some here who've yet to receive Christ. And when you open your mouth, it's very clear. You're a child of the devil. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians 4, 6. He says, let your speech always be with grace. Not sometimes. Remember, a fountain does not put out dirty water and clean water. It puts out clean water. He's saying, let your speech, what comes out of your fountain, what comes out of your heart, your mind, will, and emotions, your soul, let your speech always, not sometimes, be with grace as though seasoned with salt. I like a little salt on my eggs. I don't like a lot of salt on my eggs. A, B, C, one, two, three. Seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. All right? How do we do this? Number one, graceful speech is speech that is always with grace. What's grace? G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Graceful speech comes from God. If our conversation is to always be with grace, it must be courteous, humble, and Christ-like. It should be free from gossip, free from being frivolous. You say, what is that? That is behavior that is amusing and rather silly especially when this is not suitable. In other words, maybe you're silly and the timing of your silliness is wrong. It may be amusing, make people laugh, but if you were carried along by the Spirit, you'd know this is not the time to be amusing. Graceful speech is speech that is always with grace. Graceful speech causes others to see Christ in you. Young boys, hearing you talk, they either see Christ or they see Satan. Just by listening to your words, they're powerful. We must always remember our speech affects our witness. If you tell someone in chapel, I'm a child of God, amen, and then you go out and while you're eating lunch, you use bad language, perverted language. That's not correct. Our speech should always be edifying and encouraging. Graceful speech is speech that is always with grace. That's number one. Number two, graceful speech is speech that's always seasoned with salt. Listen, remember, seasoning something makes it taste better. Seasoned with salt here is talking about something good, not bad. Not salty conversation, 
but seasoned with salt. The expression seasoned with salt may have a number of meanings. Some commentators think that although our language should be gracious, it should be equally honest and without hypocrisy. That means graceful speech is just not happy clappy. How you doing? Oh, you're wonderful. You're so beautiful today. You know that a lot of that's just posturing, trying to get people to like you. Graceful speech is truth. Graceful speech encourages, and graceful speech also sometimes has to rebuke, but it's done in love and wisdom. It's not sarcastic. It's not too much salt on your eggs. It's like, you know what, brother? I'm glad you told me that. I needed that. So it should be equally honest and without hypocrisy. In other words, it can be somewhat pointed, but not coming from an angry man. It's coming from someone who's trying to help. You would expect a prophet to see speech in this way. In other words, a prophet in the Bible, the spiritual gift, a prophet is a person who sees everything, bottom line, black and white, end of story, and God makes them that way. But if they're not carried along by the Holy Spirit, surrendered, that gift of prophecy where they see everything, black and white, bottom line, they become so mean with that that it makes people want to run from churches instead of run to churches. And that's what's happened in the South. A lot of angry men in the pulpit, probably going back to what they heard their dad say many, many years ago, is called rejection. Who in the world wants to go sit, especially with their children, under a man full of anger, instead of tears streaming down his face as he has to rebuke from the Word of God? Paul is saying that our conversation should never be dull and flat, but should always be worthwhile and profitable. You could see an exhorter, a person with the gift of exhortation, the spiritual gift of exhortation. They encourage with the Word of God. They speak so that it'll help instead of pull down. And yes, sometimes they have to be a little pointed, but they're not angry. They're trying to say, I love you, but you got to listen. So, maybe the best way for us to really understand what graceful speech is, is to study the language of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God and who never sinned. What was he like, as far as we know, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he would speak to people, what was it like? Think about this. The woman taken in the act of adultery, she got caught having an adulterous affair with a man. They brought the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees, the religious rulers, brought her to Jesus and said, this is what she's done, and the law of Moses says she needs to be stoned. So, we see this in John 8, 10, and 11. Listen to this. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, the woman caught in adultery, Straightening up, Jesus, who is God, said to her, woman, where are they? What Jesus had said was this, you who have no sin, you cast the first stone. And none of them did because all of them knew they had sinned. And so they all walked away. The older ones walked away first. They had lived longer and committed more sin. So the, the ones who were accusing this woman called an adultery, now they've walked away without stoning her. And so Jesus straightened up. Apparently, he maybe had been kneeling down with her because they had thrown her down. He said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. Listen to what Jesus said. I do not condemn you either. That's grace. Amen. He said, I'm not condemning you. But then he said this. From now on, sin no more. You know what he did? He called her a sinner. But look how he did it. Gracefully. Amen? If you're a child of God, this same Jesus in the presence of the Holy Spirit, he lives in you. He is your bridle. God holds the reins over your mouth. You can either say, control my mouth, or you say, no, Lord, I'm going to control it. Your decision You'll be held accountable for every word you ever say 
I will not be accountable to you. I'll be only accountable to me for what comes out of my mouth. We'll never be able to blame other people for what we say. And so what we see is he showed her grace. I don't accuse you. But then he says, go and sin no more. Basically, you have been sinning, so stop it. But look how he did it so lovingly and gracefully. So what we see here, just in that small section there in Scripture, we see grace and salt. First of all, the grace, neither do I condemn you. Then the salt, go and sin no more, calling her a sinner in a gentle way. What about the woman that was at Jacob's well? In John chapter 4, verse 7, Jesus said, give me a drink. Back in those days, for a Jew to even talk with a Samaritan was disgusting. Why? Because the Jewish, they stayed within their own bloodline. The Samaritans were intermixing in marriage. And so there was hostility between the two so much they would not even talk to each other. And number two, a male, specifically Jewish, shouldn't be talking to a female. So that was the scenario. But now Jesus, who is God, look how he handled this. In John 4, 16 through 18, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Listen to what Jesus said to her now. He's being graceful. He said, you have well said. In other words, he's being positive. You have said, well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. He's basically confronting her on her sin of having many husbands. She was a Samaritan. Most other Jewish men would have walked, maybe spit on her and walked away. Not Jesus, who is God. The one who lives in us, if you're a Christian. He said, you have said, well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. That's the second time he's saying, you're speaking the truth. He's coming with a positive, but at the same time, he's letting her know that he knows she's had five husbands. And the one that she's now with is not her husband. See, this reminds us a little more of salt. Jesus knew just to mention her previous five husbands was enough. He knew conviction was set in. He didn't need to do any more of that. He knew that she knew that she was a woman of adultery. Think about Peter, the apostle Peter. Jesus had told him, you're going to deny me three times. He had already told him that. And in Luke chapter 22, verses 60 through 62, listen to this. But Peter said, man... I do not know what you are talking about. And when he said that, immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. You know what was happening? He had already denied Jesus twice. And now he's denied him the third time. And the rooster crowed, just as Jesus said that it would. So what happened? Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. That was it. Jesus did not say anything. Peter denied him three times publicly. And then the rooster crowed, just like Jesus said would happen. Remember, he knows all things. He's God. Instead of him looking at Peter and being mean toward him, Jesus just looked at him. He didn't have to say a word because he knew Peter already knew what he did wrong. There was no need to keep on and on and on. And I believe that look that Peter gave him was a look of agape love. I don't believe Peter ever got over that look. So the silence sometimes without us speaking is graceful. I remember my dad when we were being raised. If he knew that we knew that what we did was wrong, he wouldn't say anything because he knew that we knew that he knew we did something wrong. And he knew the Holy Spirit and our conscience would bother us and he saw that as punishment enough. That is pure grace, my friend. That's very unusual to see a man like that in the day in which we live. But now if my dad could tell that we didn't realize that we did something wrong, in love and with a tear in his eye, he'd take his belt off and he'd whip us. But he never did it without crying. 
and he never overdid it. And every single time he ever whipped me, I deserved every single whipping. And probably sometimes I probably needed just a few more swats. But my dad showed grace and Jesus was that way. When you think of grace, graceful speech is speech that is always seasoned with salt. And graceful speech is always speech that is according to God's word. So you think about it. Jesus looked at Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. We saw grace in that. Think about Jesus on the cross. They had stripped him down almost naked. They had cursed him. They cast lots for his clothes. They had stolen from him. They had beaten him. They beat him down his back. And then they flipped him over and beat him down his front. And now they've nailed him to a cross. Luke 23, 34. But Jesus was saying while he was nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. That's grace. First Peter 2, 23. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. He didn't retaliate. He came to do the Father's will. He came from heaven to get right in the middle of this wicked, sinful world controlled by Satan. And he died in his place. Psalm 19, 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. In other words, we need to think this way. Lord, speak through me. Lord, convict me before I speak wrongly. I'm going to obey you and surrender to you. Psalm 141, 3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, your tongue. Keep watch, that is, by the Holy Spirit, over the door of my lips. My friend, listen. We need to remember the Holy Spirit bridles our tongue if we'll say no to us and yes to Him. So graceful speech is speech that is a reflection of your heart. I've already mentioned it. When you look into a mirror, you see the outward you. When you look into the Bible, you see the inward you. When you speak, it reveals accurately your heart. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 34, You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. What we say exposes what's inside of us, what's in our heart. It's to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to to those who hear, when people hear you later this afternoon, what will they hear? Graceful, perverted, or wicked? What will they hear? The Christian speech, the child of God's speech, should be edifying, appropriate, and gracious. You say, but yeah, but you don't know what someone has said to me that hurts me so badly. It's obvious we can see that by your body language, how hurt you are. So what do I do with what I feel? Let me ask you, which one is easier? Being beaten down your back, beaten down your front, and nailed to a cross? Or dealing with someone who said something with their tongue that hurts you? Which one's the hardest? You say, well, how do I deal with it? Don't express it. They've hurt me. You don't know what they've said. Don't express it. Just leave it alone. Let the Holy Spirit bridle you, and He'll give you His peace. So don't express it and don't suppress it. In other words, don't just stick it inside and say, I'm not going to say anything, but it's obvious it's deep inside of you. Well, what do I do with it? If I don't express it, I'm not to suppress it. What do I do with it? Confess it to God. I agree with you, God. I have no right to respond in anger. I can only respond in grace because you died on the cross for me. Amen. 1 Peter 3, 
15 through 17, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile you, your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Proverbs 15, 1 a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Be a man of graceful speech. Colossians three sixteen through 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching, admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word, notice, or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him to God. Grace in your heart, my friend, is what it should be. Choose, I will speak with grace by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in me. Amen. You've been listening to Abiding Above Ministries with Chris Hodges. If you would like Chris to speak at your church or event, please go to our website, abidingabove.org. God bless you and make you a blessing.